Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I'm a staff scientist at the Council of Visualization Core Laboratory. This afternoon, I'm going to continue my series of videos on how to get started with PyTorch for deep learning on IBEX. This afternoon's topic is going to be on the use of the ARG parse library to improve your uh, Python training scripts. So instead of hard coding um, hyperparameters or global constants or paths to data files or things like this um, inside your training script, I'm going to show you how to use the ARG parse library to expose those um, parameters as command line arguments. This is going to make it much easier for you to experiment with different configurations for your models when running different jobs on IBEX. And so we're going to see how to do that today. So uh, the point of departure is the, the PyTorch GPU data science project template on the Calist VizLab GitHub page. Um, you can click use this template to create a copy of this template under your own GitHub account. Uh, you can clone, um, you can uh, use the clone link to clone this repository down to IBEX, however you want to get access to the source code on IBEX. Um, either way is fine. Um, I've, uh, I have a clone of this repository under the IBEX training user uh, on IBEX. And so I'm already logged into IBEX and I've already changed into that directory, uh, the PyTorch GPU data science project directory. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a JupyterLab server. So there's a previous video on the YouTube channel where I walk through in detail the process of launching a Jupyter server. Um, so I'm going to go through it quite quickly here. Um, so we're just going to sbatch the launch Jupyter server sbatch script. And this is going to launch our Jupyter server as a batch job on the debug partition of IBEX. Okay. So now our job has been submitted. And we can check to see if it's running. It is, in fact, running. And so now we can look at the... The error file or the slurm uh, error logs. And uh, in this uh, error log, there are going to be two things. So the first is going to be an SSH command that we can copy. And this is, this is a command that's going to create a, uh, an SSH tunnel from the compute node, in this case, GPU 510-32, on which our Jupyter server is running on the IBEX cluster. And it will be exposing data through a particular port, 12843. And this, is going, this tunnel is going to go from the compute node down to our local laptop or workstation um, to the same port on our local, on our local host. Whoops. Um, so I don't want to put this command in here. Um, so what I want to do is actually open a, a new terminal on my local machine just paste that command and hit enter. And then this creates the tunnel. So now that the tunnel is created, I can just minimize that. We don't need that anymore. OK, so now let's take a look at our, our logs again. And so now the Jupyter server has started up, but we're still waiting for that second URL, which is going to be the URL for our um, uh, the Jupyter Lab server that we're going to paste into our local, uh, our local browser. So sometimes it just takes a little bit for the uh, JupyterLab tensor board to start up. I'm sorry, for JupyterLab to start up. There we go. And what we want is actually this second link here. So this is has the one with the IP address 127.0.0.1. So this is localhost on our laptop or workstation. And when you paste that link in here, you will be connecting through the SSH tunnel to the compute node on IBEX where the server is running in the background. OK. And I will just close these for now. OK. So here we go. So we have our Jupyter Lab server up and running. And now we're ready to go. OK, so what I want to do today is 
talk about the use of the art parts library. So in the last video, we talked about how to launch a training job uh, on IFAX. And we use this train.py script. And in this train.py script, we just did some very basic things. Uh, we've got our normal imports. We defined a whole bunch of kind of hyperparameters and global constants and things like this at the very top of our script. And then we created some data sets using the CIFAR 10 data um, and then some data loaders. We created a model, in this case, ResNet 50, a loss function, an optimizer, you know, standard uh, stochastic gradient descent, a little training loop, and then we uh, saved the training model. And then we did some, some inference with the, uh, with the trained model. And then we put a classification report. Okay. So a very basic training job for CIFAR 10. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how you can improve this script. So hard coding um, values like this in the script is fine to get started, but then what you're going to find is that as you start running um, jobs on IBEX, you're going to want to experiment with maybe different learning rates or different momentums or um, other kinds of hyperparameters or different batch sizes, different numbers of data load um, workers, different random seeds, things like this. And going in and manually changing these values in the training script is tedious and error prone. And I'm going to show you a way that we can use a library in Python called argparse to um, get around all of that. Okay, so um, let's take a look at an alternative uh, way to write the same script. That uses the argparse library. So here is the, the same training script. Uh, so from about, oh, let's see, from about here on down, uh, the script is nearly identical. Um, and so I'll walk you through the, the bits and pieces that have changed. So first, I need to import the arg parse library. So this is part of the Python standard library. It's, doesn't require any extra installation or anything like that, but you just need to import it at the very top of your script. Um, the next thing that you do is you create an argument parser. Yeah. And um, actually, I should also point out that, that the arg parse uh, documentation uh, for on Python is, is excellent um, and show all of the examples that I'm using here were actually taken from the official Python documentation. So I'll put a link to this in the, um, in the details section uh, just below this video on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can uh, get access to the, the documentation. But we basically create this um, parser object and then we add a bunch of arguments and I'll, I'll walk through these in a minute. So we add a whole bunch of arguments. And then at the end, we call um, parser.parseargs, and we get a hold of this args um, object. And from this args object, we can then reference the values that were passed in um, to these various arguments. Yep. Um, so just as an example, the first argument here is a string to the data directory, so the directory where our data, um, our training data is going to live. So we, that argument is actually defined here. So when we run this from the command line, we will pass in dash dash data dash dir, followed by a string, which contains the path to the train val and test data that we're going to use. And then once we parse, them, once we parse the args here, we can access that as a, um, as an attribute of the args object by just calling dot data underscore dir. And similar for the other, um, um, for the other uh, arguments. Uh, so, but let's, let's walk through some examples here. So on the left, so we had batch size. So batch size is something that um, in general, you're going to want to set to make maximum use of your GPU memory. Uh, but 
in practice, you may end up kind of playing around with this quite a lot to try to find a, a good batch size for your problem. So that's an, that's, uh, an argument that we don't want to hard code in our training script. We want to pass it in as a command line argument. And if we go up here, here is how you would do that. So the batch size is just an integer. So this string here is the format that we want to pass that argument in at the command line. So in the command line, we'll have our training script and then we'll have dash dash batch size and then followed by an integer specifying the batch size that we want to use. And the default that I have set is 256, which from our previous video we know is the largest batch size that will fit on the um, in the GPU memory for the model that we're training. Um, so I've set that to 256. The type is an integer. So if we um, specify the various data types that we expect to um, pass in, then the parser will make sure that those data types are available when we access the values within our Python script. So by setting this to be integer, it means that when we access the batch size, which will be down here in our data loaders, that this args.batch size returns an integer and not a string or, or something else. OK. Um, and then there's a help. So you can put help, and then you can put a string that kind of explains what the uh, what this command line argument or what this parameter is supposed to represent. OK. And so what I've done is so let's go through another let's go through another example. So um, so let's do a string. So here's how you specify a string. So our, we've got our data dir, and then it has type string and a little help message. And then that means down here, when we access args.datadir, so this will be a string. So we've passed in a string, and then we're wrapping it in the pathlib.path object in order to get a hold of our, of our data directory. And you can see also that we've done kind of the same thing here um, with our um, output directory. So the output directory is, is specified here. Yeah. Um, similarly, um, you can add, so another thing that you can do with these, these um, parser arguments is they can have default arguments. So here's an example of a string with a default argument. So the output file name. So as part of this script, after we're done training the model, we save the model uh, to disk. So we have a, a serialized version of the trained model with its parameters and things like that. So by default, that file will be model.pt. Um, and so I've specified that here, but you can change it and it will be represented as um, whatever file name you put in and it will be saved into the output directory automatically. Okay. Um, so let's look at some a floating point number. So the learning rate. So here is an example of how you would specify a floating point argument uh, with a default value. So here is optimizer learning rate. So this is going to be obviously the learning rate for our optimizer. I've given it a default value of one e to the minus three, and it has a type float. So this means that when we go down here and define our optimizer here, we can access the args.optimizer learning rate and args.optimizer momentum and get floats out, which is what we need those, uh, those to be. And so the optimizer momentum is uh, here. OK. Um, so let's look at one more example. Um, so you can have. Um, values that are uh, required. So here's an example of um, of a um, of an argument that is required. So data loader number of workers. So it's listed as required. So this this must be specified. Um, otherwise, an error will be given before you even try to run the program. And it needs to have an integer. And I've not given it a default value. So you will have to specify the, the number of workers that you want um, uh, 
uh, that you want to create for your data loaders. And it's really important that you expose this parameter um, like this on IBAX because you want to make sure that the number of workers is equal to the number of CPUs that you request to use um, as part of your training job. So you want each, C, each data uh, loader to have its own, uh, its own CPU, or each worker that's doing data loading to have its own CPU. This will maximize the, the throughput of your uh, training data from disk or from memory into the GPU. Uh, so that's very important to, to set the data loaded number of workers appropriately. Um, okay, so anything else? Ah, a Boolean. So here I've added a, um, I've added a disabled GPU uh, flag. So the way this works is that if we pass dash dash disable GPU, then um, the parser will store that as true and interpret it as saying, I want to disable the GPU. And then down here in, um, in the code, notice that I have this, I define a device, which will be torch.deviceCPU. So you do CPU training, um, if args.disable GPU. So that's, if that's true, else, torch.deviceCUDA, so else do GPU training. So if we do not pass in the dash dash disable GPU, then we will get GPU training by default. So the default will be GPU and you only get CPU training if you actively disable. Um, so that's just a way to, um, to show you how to use these kind of Boolean indicator flags as parser arguments. There's another one. Um, so tucked in disable, so the, I, use the talk to him, um, package to create a progress bar for training, which is great for kind of interactive jobs when I'm debugging and I want to see how fast things are going, but it doesn't, it's not really useful to, um, to log that uh, progress bar out into the slurm logs. It just doesn't work very well. So when I'm doing batch jobs, I tend to disable that. And so I have a flag here where I can just pass in dash dash talk to disable if I want to disable the, the training progress bar. Okay, so here are some things that, so if you notice like most of the arguments, most of the things over here and the, the original train.py script, most of these things are actually now exposed as arguments, command line arguments at the parser. Um, that can be then parsed into arguments that we can access in our training script, but not all of them. And there, there's a few things, there's a few things I haven't exposed. So the first is the number of classes so in this setup, because I'm working with CIFAR 10 data set and the CIFAR 10 data set only has 10 classes, so that number will never change. So there's no point in exposing it as um, a command line argument because it's not something that would ever need to change. Similarly, uh, the resize size, because I'm working with ResNet 50 and ResNet 50 expects inputs that are 224 um, by 224, there's no point in exposing the resize size as a parameter that might change. Um, so I've just left it defined here at the top. Um, and, and then similar, these other things are functions of input parameters. Like I'm just wrapping um, the input data dir string as a pathlib.path path object, similarly for output dir and then output file path and things like that. Um, other things, um, so these Booleans here, you see these trues and falses. So these are things that should never really change. So there's no point in exposing them. Um, uh, in particular, so we always want to shuffle the training data loader and we always don't shuffle the testing data loader and persistent workers and pen memory being set to true is an optimization that is important for both uh, when you're working with, with GPUs. Uh, so the penning of memory is important because um, it, it eliminates a step in getting memory from CPU to GPU. So normally if data comes into CPU memory, it has to go to penned memory, which is portion of CPU memory that's mapped directly into the GPU before it can go into GPU memory. 
But since we know that our tensors are headed to the GPU anyway, we can just tell the CPU to just allocate the data initially in pinned memory. And therefore it has a single step to go into the GPU instead of having to do two copies. So it's a, a little optimization that can speed things up uh, a little bit. And then persistent workers equals true. We, we generally want to set that um, to be true. Um, so your workers are, are recreated. Um, I believe it's every training epoch. Your workers will be, will be torn down and then recreated again from scratch. So this process of tearing down your workers and then building them up again, um, and it goes on completely in the background to you as the user, but it, it costs time and resources. And it's a, a memory optimization. So keeping the workers around requires a little bit more memory usage, but um, that's generally not a constraint in the, the training jobs that we see here on Ibex. And so in general, I always recommend that people have persistent workers equals true. And um, I think that's about it in terms of there are no other kind of magic numbers or constants or things like that in this code. Okay. So I've kind of walked you through the train dash arg parse uh, dot pi script. So let's uh, close this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open now in the bin directory, we have our, uh, our train dot s batch script. So I want to look at that. Um, and then we're going to look at our launch train script. Okay. So our train dot s batch script has changed um, a little bit from last time. Um, so we still have our slurm headers, so there's nothing new there. And we still set up our conda environment and we still um, start the uh, NVIDIA dashboard server. And we talked about that in the previous video. And, and then at the end, we need to shut down the NVIDIA dashboard server. But what's changed is that um, we now have this Python and then this, this bash, uh, um, special bash variable here, dollar sign, and then the at symbol inside quotation marks. And what this means is that um, any command line arguments that we pass to the train don sbat script will be gathered up and passed directly into um, the Python uh, uh, the Python program. So what this means is that we can pass not only a particular training script, but any command line arguments that that training script might expect. Um, directly into our um, as command line arguments to this train.sbash script. And it, they will be transparently to you um, replaced here. And then the script will run. So this is like a very generic training script now, because all it says is that we want to launch a job, a training job on IBEX with some resources allocated by Slurm uh, inside of a conda environment where we have uh, NVIDIA dashboard monitoring. And then it needs to be a Python script. That's it. So you could use this training script over and over and over again, this train.sbatch, without having to make any changes. The only place that you make changes is in this launch-train shell script. And let me, uh, so let me show you that. So this last time, we had a launch-train shell script where um, uh, in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, version, uh, we were just using this to do sbatch and then a job name um, and then a path to uh, the training script that we want, the train.sbatch script that we wanted to run. And then we would pass in just the name of the Python script that we were going to run. But now we're going to pass in not just the name of the Python script, but then all of these command line arguments. OK. Um, so a couple of interesting things here to note. So first, uh, if you're not familiar with multi-line commands in bash, that's what this, this uh, slash here is indicating. So 
When you want to have a multi-line command in bash, you just put a slash at the end. And it's very important that there not be any white space after the slash. Um, so if you have a space here, that would cause a failure. So you want to make sure that there's no white spaces after, um, after the, uh, the slashes. I guess the other thing I'm, I'm doing here is, um, is I am, so I'm passing in a job name. And I'm also passing in a slurm uh, variable. So a certain number of CPUs per GPU. And I'm setting that as, a, as an environment variable here. So I'm setting CPUs per GPU to six. And so here I can actually override any slurm, uh, slurm headers that were actually inside this train.sbatch script. I can override those. Um, so in particular, um, if, for example, I had a train.sbatch, um, if this was a four, then um, it would be overridden by the value six that I've passed in here. Yeah, OK. So that's just an example of how you can override, um, you can override values uh, that are inside your Slurm headers actually from the command line when you launch them. Okay, so let's actually, um, let's actually launch this job. So what I can do, so just like last time, I can get a, oops, a new terminal. Let's get rid of this. And I don't need this art parse anymore. Let's just pull this down here. OK. And now I can um, launch this job on IBEX simply by running this launch train script. So um, let's take a look at where am I on IBEX. So I'm inside the PyTorch GPU data science project. So then if I just do this launch training script, now I will have submitted that batch job. I can take a look and I can see that I have two jobs running. So this is my uh, JupyterLab server job where I've been running. And then this is my uh, training script, which is pending for resources. So it looks like um, someone else might be on the debug partition using that other, um, the other V100 GPU so what I can do is I'll just go ahead and cancel this job. And I will go back to my train.sbatch script. And instead of running this on debug partition, I'll try to run it on the batch partition. So I'm just going to save that change. So now I'm running it on the batch partition. And uh, I'll run it again. And so now I've submitted that job again. And now this time it's running. So there must have been some, some free GPUs on the batch partition. And so now that job is running. OK. So I'm just going to let that run, uh, that run for a little bit. Um, but it doesn't take uh, too, too terribly long. So let's actually look and see um, if we And actually, how long is this going to run? I'm not actually sure because I didn't pass in a number of training epochs. So if we go back and look at, um, the arg parse. So in here, there should have been a, um, ah, number of training epochs. So the default was just to do one training epoch. So that's not going to be uh, nearly enough. And in fact, it means that. Uh, the job probably won't take very long. So what we'll want to do is go back to our um, launch train shell script. And we'll go in here and we'll just add um, num training epics. And then we'll add you know, however many number of training epics we want. So maybe, um, I don't know, five, say some larger number, and we would save that. Now, um, what's nice about this setup 
is that I can actually start this uh, training job running again. Um, ah, and I'll get an error. And that error says that this output dir command not found. And that's because I forgot the output dir was a required argument. And I forgot um, to add this slash at the end. So let's see what's going on here. All right, so I still have these two jobs running. So this was the, uh, the job which is gonna run for one training epic. And here, I could, I'm gonna relaunch this job, but running for five training epics. So I've added this, uh, this command line argument here. Um, and so let's, let's launch this again. There we go. So now, now we have three jobs running. Um, so this one is our newest job, and it will run for five training epics now. Now, a major benefit of of this approach is that I'm changing um, I'm changing arguments in this launch train shell script, and these are arguments that are being passed into um, uh, passed into sbatch. So, for example. Uh, while my job is running, if I was to go s control show job ID and then I'll pick this one here. Okay, so you can see, so this is the output. So this is basically just information about your running job and you know when you submitted it, how long it's going to run for, some stuff about the resources that you've requested. But in particular, it has the command. And notice that the command automatically keeps information about the values that you passed in at the command line, including the number of training epochs. So if I compare this um, to the other job, which hopefully it's still running, you'll see that that number of training epics was not included because we didn't include that at the command line. So using this command line um, approach allows you to capture these arguments um, in a way that it's easier to keep track of, of what arguments you use on what job, okay? Now, it's also important to note that if you go into your, let me show you the other, this is a common mistake. What I'm about to tell you is a common mistake um, that I see new users to IBEX make. So in your train.py script, um, so if we launch a job with uh, by just using, um, if you were to use this launching script and just launch instead of the train dash arg parse with these command line arguments, if we just launched train.py. So our original training script where we've hard coded everything inside the training script. We launched this as a job on IBEX and maybe the, the resources are busy. So the job sits in the queue for a little bit. And then we think, oh, okay, I wanna run a different experiment. So you go into your train.py and you make changes to these numbers or these inputs, and then you launch another job. And so now you have two jobs in the queue. The problem is, is that when that first job runs, it will, see the changes that you made to the train.py script. And so actually you'll end up getting two jobs running the same settings, which is probably not what you intended. Whereas by exposing the arguments as uh, command line parameters with the arg using the arg parse library, like I've been talking about here, you make these changes in the launch script. So I, I make changes here, I launch a job. That job has those changes embedded in it. I make more changes, I launch another job. So now I have a second job, but that second job has different parameters. And so you, you avoid this, um, this potential serious mistake of making changes to hard-coded values in your training script and launching a bunch of jobs and thinking that you've done a lot of experiments. Okay. Okay, so that's, um, I, th I think that's everything that I wanted to say about um, uh, about art parts.
So it looks like our first job had finished. Our, our first training, our one training epic job had finished. Our five training job, epic job is still running. Um, that will take a few more minutes and then it'll end. Okay, uh, but that's it. So the, the big takeaway here, so let me, let me get rid of this. Use ARG parse. It's a great library. It's available as part of the Python standard library. Um, it's very common that you'll, you'll see ARG parse used in, um, in a lot of particularly scripts that are used in production at, um, at companies uh, or maybe in projects that have been more fully developed at other universities. Um, it, it works really well on IBEX. It's a great way to expose your command line arguments. Even when we get to more advanced training videos where we start talking about hyperparameter tuning, you can expose um, um, values for describing the bounds of your hyperparameter sampling procedure as command line arguments, even though the hyperparameter sampling procedure is embedded in your training script. So this is still a great way um, for doing hyperparameter tuning. Um, and we'll get to that uh, eventually. So again, all this code is going to be up on the, uh, the pipe or is up on the PyTorch GPU data science project template. Um, so please use it. Uh, let me know how you get on uh, with using ARG parts to improve your, your PyTorch uh, training scripts. I, I should also add, this isn't particular to PyTorch. Obviously, you can use the same approach for scikit-learn, for TensorFlow, for any, any Python script. So I'm just using it as an example uh, here with PyTorch, but obviously it will work. Um, it will work for other frameworks as well. So good luck with ARG parse. Uh, feedback is always appreciated. Let me know if you have any questions and um, that's all for now. See you again soon. Bye.